Welcome to the Evolved Caveman, where men learn to be successful and happy with your host, Dr. John Schinnerer, as he shares the most impactful ideas and practices for you to get the most from your relationships, your work, and from your life. Now, here's Dr. John. Hey guys, this is Dr. John Schinnerer back with the latest episode of the Evolved Caveman. And I'm really excited today to have with me my guest, Tori Health. Tori is a transformational coach and mindset expert for purpose-driven entrepreneurs. She helps people transform from the inside out so they can live on purpose, live their purpose, step into their personal power, accelerate success, all while maintaining their relationships and well-being. Tori holds a bachelor's and a master's in psychology, as well as a secondary master's specialization in transformational coaching. After spending nearly a decade in HR leadership, she left her success in the corporate world in 2012 to follow her passion and begin her own coaching practice, and she's been coaching ever since. Tori is incredibly passionate about coaching and business, yet she's also a certified yoga and meditation teacher and effortlessly blends Western psych and Eastern mindfulness to help her clients get big results. In her spare time, you can find her taking a yoga class, catching a plane to the next country she wants to visit, or walking the beaches next to her California home with her husband and her dog. Tori, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am as well. So let's start off with your personal story, which is an amazing testament to your resiliency. So tell us a little bit about your origin story. Yeah, I think after that bio, people would really assume that I had a pretty nice upbringing, right? You know, a couple of degrees in psychology, living near the beach. So I love to kind of go back to where I was born, which was I was born in a rehab center to my mother who was getting through heroin addiction. Wow. And sadly, she never kicked her addiction her whole life. So, you know, she was in and out of, she went to jail, she had multiple marriages, there was a ton of like adversity through my growing up, you know, K through six, I went to, I think seven schools. Mm. So I had this incredibly challenging childhood of trying to take care of and raise my own mother while raising myself. And then I also had a little brother and I helped take care of him. And my father, my biological father wasn't in the picture, but of course the men that she would typically choose would also be addicts. So Mm. I had this in, this incredible story of tragedy to triumph. You know, if you look at statistically, I definitely shouldn't be where I am. So when I speak about the things I do, I really come from a place of compassion and understanding. We don't all have the same start in life, but I truly madly deeply believe that we can make a different choice to change our outcome. That's fantastic. Yeah. It seems like you've come so far from the beginnings Yeah. The sad thing, if you look at my sister was older, my eldest sister, you know, we were both born to the same mother and, you know, she overdosed in 2012. Mm. So you have this completely different dichotomy of same mother, same upbringing, but completely different paths that, that we can go down. Yeah. I mean, I love the the concept of resiliency and that resiliency to me is the ability to bounce back from the hardships that inevitably life will throw our way, which aren't our choice, but are our responsibility to overcome. So the more resilient we can become, the more it is that we can bounce back from these challenges with greater energy, wisdom, experience. Any other thoughts on resiliency for you? Yeah, resiliency to me is kind of the core of life because we are not guaranteed a pain-free life. If you no, live, guaranteed a painful life. But, uh, yeah, pretty, that's, pretty, that's much, pretty right? much a given. Yeah, it's like life will always hand you something that's going to be difficult, and my difficulties will probably look very difficult, very different than most people's difficulties. And I recognize that you know, and there's people who've had it way worse than me, mm-hmm. but all of us do have that choice and that responsibility to create resiliency. And what's really fascinating is that we see that resiliency is something we can build. Yeah. And that's the scary thing. It's like, well, how do, you know, when you're in that darkness or you're in those moments, you wonder, how do I get through this? Yeah. And I love that point. I, I like to think of resiliency as a muscle that gets stronger that we, the more that we use it. Um, the more Absolutely. It. So tell me what were some of the most important tools that you used or that helped you to overcome that past? Yeah. I, I feel like initially growing up, I was really angry and that drove me. (laughs) 
I kind of understandable. Yeah, I was angry and I was upset and I was kind of determined to make something of myself and not not live that path. But ultimately that didn't lead to happiness. That just kind of burned me out. So I think in my early 20s, you know, as an early psychology major and or you know, young kid trying to figure out why the things had happened to me that they did and the biggest one that started my path was trying to find meaning in my mess. So really looking like if we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. Mm-hmm. And I was lucky enough to move to Japan when I was 19 and I was introduced to Buddhism. Mm. And they talk a lot about looking differently at your journey and that though we've, you know, we've got this pain, suffering is optional. And did I really need to keep suffering over a past that was gone, like bringing myself into the present? And they also believe that we choose our parents to evolve the soul, mm-hmm. which really messed with me for, <laughs> for a while. I wouldn't choose that. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, Why the hell would I choose that? <laughs> exactly. That was very triggering for me at first. But honestly, by the, you know, by the time I started to get through school, I started to be like, wow, I you know, if I did not have this path, I would not be here as I am trying to make myself better so that ultimately that led me to wanting to help people. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you mentioned that you were angry at first, and I think that's a pretty common dynamic. And it it makes me think that that anger is there for a purpose that, you know, I felt the same thing. And, you know, I think the anger can be used to fuel you towards, development towards helping out others towards overcoming your your challenges and then i think we get to an age where it's like okay i don't really need this anymore i don't want it i need to find some ways to let it go yeah anger is a, a powerful emotion i think it's particularly those of us who i you know i was raised in a situation as i think many people are where vulnerability and being hurt was not an option yeah you know, like I could not show weakness in my situation. There was physical abuse and those, those were choices I had to make. Like I couldn't cry because I would be told, I'll give you something to cry about. Yep. And, you know, and most, and especially men, like we, I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, my biological father is actually like a Marine, like a drill instructor for the Marines. <laughs> so wow. I think, in, I think in a lot of ways I have the, that in me. So I totally understand how Anger promoted me, and anger only ever means no or ouch. So I should have said no to something or something hurt me. But yes, anger is a much better energy than being down or depressed. Right. It's a step up. It is. It's a step up. And I think some people get upset with themselves that they're angry, but that anger is transformative. Anger is the energy of fire from the yogic perspective, Mm -hmm. right? It is the the catalyst. It's what raises us out of the lows. Well, yeah, and it gives you energy to move and to do something, to take action. Whereas if you're depressed about your situation, it's harder to motivate. Absolutely. Like, you know, I always tell my clients if they're in a low, A, do something for someone else to get out of your own stuff. And B, getting them to a little bit of anger is actually not a bad thing at all. Yeah, Yeah, I see that as progress. Totally, it is progress. Mm -hmm. So getting out of that anger and getting through the anger, because we only know the only way, you know, the only way out is through mm-hmm. <laughs> those emotions. Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately. So once I started to find this meaning in my, the mess that my life had been, I got to a place of forgiveness. Yeah. And that took me a long time in an active practice, you know, because some of the things that had happened to me, and I know many people who are listening, feel unforgivable. But forgiveness isn't for the other person. It's for you. You never, ever have to tell them you've forgiven them. It's like, you know, they they quote the Buddha as saying this. I don't know if you really said it or not. But forgiveness, unforgiveness in your heart is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Mm -hmm. And so through forgiving my mother, I was able to let things go and recognize that she was my greatest teacher and she taught me compassion. She taught me resilience. She taught me strength that I couldn't have paid someone to teach me. You know, I know how to pull myself out of anything. And I have that self-efficacy, which is really what resilience is, is knowing that no matter how hard life hits us down, we can get back up. Yeah. And I think one of the things that comes out of that sort of situation is the confidence that you can deal with any situation that's thrown your way. Absolutely. 
once we get through <laughs> through the difficulty mm-hmm. and you know so forgiveness i think of that as like lightening my load right so i was able to start letting go and forgiveness is not a one and done <laughs> no i was going to ask how long did it take you to forgive your mom because that's a process that could take definitely months if not years it took me years. You know, there was a point where my parents were so toxic, you know, my biological parents were so toxic for me that I actually didn't talk to them. So I think there was a seven year period where I didn't speak with my mom and that allowed a lot of healing. But towards the end of her life, um, cause she died early also of drug, mm-hmm. drug related incidences. I was able to get to a place where we reconnected before she died. And I didn't necessarily tell her all of my for forgiveness, but I was able to see her differently and learn more about her past and what had led her to do the things she'd done, because we know that hurt people just hurt other people. And I knew she'd had a really rough childhood as well. You know, trauma is a big thing with addiction. Mm -hmm. Hurt people are just trying to help themselves. And it's the the best solution they've found so far. It's not always, you know, it's not the primary problem. So I definitely see addiction different than most people, but you know, I wouldn't have had any of that if I didn't get to the ultimate forgiveness. And I think in her passing, that is like, there's just nothing to hold on anymore. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say at that point, you know, we have to remember that it's, it's memories that we're replaying over and over and we have a choice whether or not we carry those with us or we put them down. Yeah, well said. And, and I think that's a nice segue to the topic of mindsets. And we know that mindsets are critical in terms of overcoming adversity or weight loss or pain management or proper learning or slowing the aging process or even happiness. How do you approach teaching mindsets to clients? Yeah, I love to define what mindsets are because I feel like a lot of, you know, my mother-in-law is funny. She's like, you do all this amazing work, but I don't always know what you're talking about. <laughs> So, so I like to explain that mindsets are just the established set of attitudes that we have. And attitudes are really a settled way of thinking about life yourself. And it typically comes out in our behavior, right? Anyone who's been a parent or who's managed anyone has seen a bad attitude. <laughs> we don't really recognize that we have negative attitudes, thoughts, and beliefs about things. We just kind of think they are the way things are. So like, you know, I grew up in a way where it was like, everything was bad. I was always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And so how did I live my life? (laughs) Always afraid and waiting for the other shoe to drop, trying to control everything, you know, fearful for what might go wrong. And I'll get more into that later about the body coming into it. But I kind of have the ABCDs of mindset. (laughs) Okay, let's hear them. Yeah. So I always start with people with awareness. So you have to become aware of what's going on in your own mind. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how you start to see the world, like, or, you know, like what's going on in your own mind when, when your partner says something that like gets you, how can you take that pause and go, okay, what's that about? The B is our belief systems. So really understanding how we see the world and how our past has kind of programmed us to believe life is, you know, we grew up with a lot of sayings in our culture. I grew up, you know, bad things happen in threes. Money doesn't grow on trees. You can't have that. And so even when I was successful at 30 and making six figures, I wouldn't let myself have anything. And I would, (laughs) I would manifest ways to get rid of my money. (laughs) So (laughs) there's interesting things about what we believe we kind of subconsciously create. And we take these micro actions that help us see in the world, what we believe to be true. And then when we see other people that it's not happening to, we believe that they're lucky Mm -hmm. and that life just doesn't happen to them the way it happens to us. And I know that's hard to hear because it was hard for me (laughs) to hear. And then consciousness, which for me is really about mindfulness and bringing our awareness to the present. Because one part of my story that I didn't get to that, you know, I could make a movie of my life. But but as an adult, ever since I left left my corporate job to start my practice, I experienced the death of you know, a lot, like I had four deaths in about five years and that included my sister overdosing and, uh, my grandmother who'd, you know, been there for me, like a lot of important people in my dive in my life had passed away. And so mindfulness was actually one of the most powerful things to help me get through grief is because I could be really present and say, you know, that pain is so heavy, but right now in this moment, I need to focus on what I need to do. 
And I would be able to say like, that's not happening today. It's not happening right now. Like she's already passed and I can get through this moment. I can help this client. I can be kind to this person at Starbucks. And that, that consciousness and mindfulness was like the most powerful thing for, for grief. And those really heavy emotions is bringing ourselves to the present moment. Cause the problem is usually in the past or we're worried about the future. Yeah. I like the question right here, right now, is everything okay? Yes. Because it, it's a hallmark of contentment that if you can remind yourself that, okay, wait, right now, right here, like, I'm okay, I have everything that I need. And my mind keeps trying to pull me back to the past in terms of grieving. So if you can keep reminding yourself of that, and it's almost second by second. I mean, it, it is a lot of effort. It you know? is. It takes on a massive amount of awareness. So that's what, you know, awareness is where the key, you know, and we know this through, through, you know, emotional intelligence and all those things, everything, the core of everything is awareness. And so most people ask me, well, how do I get more aware? Well, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to sit with yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're really? Have... Isn't there a shortcut? <laughs> so, there is no hacking when it comes to these <laughs> deep things. You know, meditation was the key for me. Some people, it might just be learning how to do the deep breath work and, and pause and get, in, get into themselves. You know, some people, I have them like physically to get back into mindfulness. If they're driving, you know, put your hands on the wheel, like sing the song, like get yourself present because it's so easy for us to lose ourselves in our minds. You know, my, my personal yoga guru used to tell me that the mind is like a Rottweiler, that it's either going to walk me or I'm going to walk it, but the choice is mine. (laughs) And so that always sat with me. And then the the D of the ABCD for mindset is the daily practices. Mm -hmm. Because mindset, you know, we are wired for survival. That is the, the core of our brain, particularly those of us who've had trauma or difficulty, the part of that brain that wants to keep us safe is very strong and it's meant to keep us alive and it does a really good job. (laughs) But unless we're in mortal danger, we live with a lot of fear and worry and what ifs. So for me, it's all about those daily practices of, you know, gratitude and movement, meditation, those things that work for you. Sometimes we have to try them out, but, you know, gratitude is well studied and they've seen changes in depression scores just from writing down the three things that you're most grateful for each day. Yeah. Gratitude's a huge one. I think of it as a foundational skill. And, and I think you're right. A lot of times I'll tell clients that, you know, at the end of our work, I'll give them a sheet of uh, three pages of single lines of those daily practices. And I'll tell them pick five and do them daily. And then you may have to rotate through them and do different ones according to your needs. Cause at points, Ones may not work for you that used to work in the past, that sometimes you need to learn new ones or incorporate new ones. Because one of the things we know from research is that you don't want to do the same thing over and over and over to the point where it becomes habit, and then it just kind of goes, (laughs) and it it doesn't have any benefit for us anymore. So I I think the variation becomes a big point, a big key to it as well. Absolutely, because what got us to the level we're at now won't necessarily get us to the level we want to go to. Right. Particularly when we're looking to be you know, more successful, more happy, more present. It does take another level, but gratitude is the foundation of moving through that negative mindset that we're just kind of all programmed to have because it keeps us safe. And so it's a good way to start. And there's so many ways to do gratitude too. Like I've learned, I've gone into the next level of (laughs) gratitude where now I write what I'm grateful that's coming. So I actually start Mm -hmm. to like look into the future for like positive creation. So I can start seeing the end result of what I want to create. Yeah. I like the idea of, you know, there's four levels of gratitude. So one is sort of gratitude for really basic, obvious things. Like I'm grateful for my mom or my dad or my children, I'm grateful for my car. And then there's gratitude for more subtle things. So I'm grateful for the ability to feed myself with a fork or walk on my own two legs. And then there's gratitude for our biggest challenges in life. So I'm grateful for my divorce, which taught me better emotional management skills. And then the fourth level is what you're talking about, gratitude for things that are to come. Yeah, that you explained it perfectly. <laughs> and I think the hardest one to get through is level three, which is being uh, great, um, grateful for the yes. difficulty. It's, and yeah. I, and that is, I mean, that that does that ultimately came from Buddhism, which you know, five thousand years old. But the loving kindness meditation of sending uh, one of my favorites. Sending, yeah, sending that positivity to someone else, even when you know, and when you're in it and you're in the challenge, that's the most powerful time to do it. Well, and it's funny, like I've 
taught loving kindness or meta to men, to male clients. And I said, you know, go home, practice this daily, and then come back and tell me what it's like next week. And so many men come back and they're like, yeah, you know, I did this and it was all good until I got to the point of wishing kind thoughts upon myself. May I be happy? May I be healthy? May I live life with ease and well-being? And then it just felt weird. So I stopped. And yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, yes. And remember that learning to ride a bike, that didn't feel normal at first either. It's a new skill. You have to continue to practice through that discomfort. And it's incredibly valuable. And it, it feels unusual because we're just not used to it. No, it's not. And we don't, you know, I've started my career primarily coaching, you know, executive men and they definitely, you know, that drive always gets in the way of like, what, then what's the next best thing and recognizing their strengths and giving themselves a break for giving themselves mm -hmm. seeing that they deserve good too. You know, they're usually driven to help raise up their family and raise up their team. And it's like, Oh yeah, but you've got to raise up too and see that you deserve good so that all those other people can benefit. And so many, like I'll talk to them about self-compassion and they're like, they're really resistant to let go of, or at least even have a, a different gear to shift into from that inner critic. And they're like, well, yeah, but yelling at myself has motivated me all these years. Why would yep. I do it differently? It's the only thing that works. Like, well, because it depresses you and makes you feel like shit about yourself. Yeah. There, there's like this whole thing about the inner critic versus healthy striving. Mm -hmm. It's like, we can't really change ourselves through negativity. It's like a lot of people hate their body. And so they work out, but that, that mindset of hate will actually create negative results. Like what we put in, we get out. Well, and it's also that idea of you can't punish a child into good behavior. Yes. That's like, a good way to think you have of to it. Encourage them and teach them how to behave well. Yes. Not and just that's punish them for doing the wrong thing. And that's always a great way to get people who are parents to remember, like, would you say the things you say to yourself, to your mm -hmm. children? And nine out of 10 times they're like, well, absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> well, you believe everything you think. So you better be careful what you say to yourself. All right. So let's shift gears a little bit. Like you yeah. mentioned earlier that you wanted to bring in sort of the body to this. Tell me a little bit about energy psychology. I'm not that well versed in this area. Yeah, it's, it's actually not that new. It's been around about 30 years, but it's just now gaining traction. So what they started to notice in research, and I also noticed this in myself, was that when you're someone who maybe like experiences a lot of anxiety or you've had a lot of past trauma, the nervous system is pretty on edge all the time. And so some people actually can go to therapy for years for the anxiety and not make any changes because they're in an anxious, they're in a physically anxious state and they can't get the body to cooperate with the mind. And we've all experienced this when we've had anxiety, we've been upset about something and you can't calm your mind down because most of us don't realize it's stuck in the body. Mm -hmm. And now we know in trauma work that you know, like Dr. Bessel van der Kolk and Peter Levine, all these amazing psychologists who've really looked at the body primarily, that the body matters a lot in clearing things for the mind. And part of my big part of my healing story that I, for, I forgot to mention was yoga for me was the start of my energy healing. And I think energy, like energetically, I think yoga saved my life because I did have all this, physical, you know, all this trauma from childhood, but you know, by the grace of something greater, I wandered into a yoga class at 19. I mean, I've been practicing for 20 years now. Wow. And, yeah, and that's one of the best ways to deal with trauma from what I understand. Exactly. Is, is we have to get into the body first. And even in high performance, if you're someone who's always, you know, like I call it the, a great risk manager, someone who can always see the negative or what could go wrong with a project or, or that, that type of mindset we have to get into the body. So what's fascinating about energy psychology is it's kind of like, I get, I always say, you know, it's like acupressure and neuroscience had a baby. <laughs> so it's East meets West mm -hmm. and it is a mind body approach to healing, not only PTSD or PTSI, depending on what people call it now, but it helps to align our internal, like our body and our nervous system with our consciously held goals. So a lot of people don't recognize they have inner conflicts and you brought up weight loss, which is a great one for inner conflict. Um, there was a story about in energy psychology, there was a, a male guard, right? He was a cop and okay. he was very large and he wanted to lose weight and he needed to lose weight for his health. 
and he could not lose weight no matter what he was doing. And ultimately they found that there was an inner conflict unconscious, but the reason he was holding onto the weight was because he actually felt safer as the big guy on the block. And so sometimes we have these inner conflicts that are so strong that the body's actually fighting the mind on what is the desired outcome. And so it's kind of like, you know, the story of Sisyphus, <laughs> you know, the Greek God, he had to roll the, the, the large the boulder hill. up the hill for life. And it just kept falling back down. And sometimes in life, that's how we feel. So energy psychology was like the biggest thing, you know, you use tapping different meridians and holding these places on the body while doing the mental work to kind of, I guess, pour gasoline on it, but really to help you get an energetic alignment and deal with the nervous system and the brain while you're doing that work. So you don't have any of these inner conflicts or self-sabotaging behaviors, you can help get rid of them that way. Yeah, the, the way I think about it is that the vagus nerve is a big piece of this and really largely responsible for that mind-body connection, which is also closely tied to the autonomic nervous system, which splits into the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, which to me are like the gas and the brakes on the car if we're a car. So we're really good at stepping on the gas and getting our adrenaline going and getting energized. We're not very good at hitting the brakes, relaxing, and turning off that stress response. And for those of us who have been traumatized to some extent or another, you can heighten that stress response. And for some of us, I think you can keep it locked in the on position. So Absolutely. off becomes critical, learning how to relax, learning how to be happy, learning how to be content, learning how to feel safe and secure is huge. And it's huge for reaching our goals. It's huge for making meaningful connections with other people. And it's huge for being an excellent leader. Mm -hmm. Like if we're always in that gas on, you know, it's basically a toxic stress on the body. Yeah. And what's fascinating is we know now that the body can't heal when it's in that on position right. all the time. And you're not as logical or as clear because when that, mo <laughs> when the other side of the brain takes over, <laughs> <laughs> it's way stronger and we have to turn it off in well, order have three to get options here. It's fight, flight, freeze. Exactly. And I, a lot of the men that I see seem to live in that area where it's, you know, either anger, irritability, sadness, depression, or some degree of anxiety or stress. And yeah. it limits how you think it limits the actions that are available to you. And, and one of the things that keeps me locked into that, you know, trying to keep initiating or turning on that sympathetic nervous system or pardon me, the parasympathetic and the relaxation response is that idea that Barbara Fredrickson came up with that, you know, if we're not in, if we're not feeling safe and secure, then we're effectively eliminating half of the positive emotions available to us because we can't yeah. feel half of the positive emotions if we're not feeling safe and secure first. For instance, if you're in a dark alleyway and you see a couple guys coming at you, you're not going to laugh because you're going to be a little bit fearful or a lot fearful. So there's certain emotions that we don't feel that we need to and want to feel that if we're not turning that the parasympathetic nervous system or the relaxation response on, we're eliminating a huge part of the positive emotional spectrum for ourselves. Yeah, it's just physically impossible to feel both at the same time. And it can only be on or off. That's, that's the hard part. And teaching people that they'd be actually much more effective in that calm state is hard when we are especially those of us who've had trauma and they've seen this in police and firefighters that a lot of them have had trauma as children and they end up in these helping professions because nerve, like nerve wise, we're like used to running into the danger. <laughs> we're used to having that heightened level of stress and we get a little bit on the addicted side to it. We feel like it's normal and it's comfortable. Well, and it's, it's interesting to me. I interviewed Dr. Faith Harper uh, who wrote this book called unfuck your brain and she's a trauma psychologist, mm -hmm. and her definition of trauma is anything that disconnects you from that feeling of safety. And I thought, wow, that's a really inclusive definition of trauma. And she doesn't go into kind of defining what might be trauma because she said it's different for each of us. We have a different level of resiliency, tolerance, uh, ability to deal with it. But it made me think, it made me go back and look at my own past and go, okay, so what might have led me to feel disconnected from safety? And it's like, whoa, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, it's actually kind of bigger. It, it opens the pool much wider when you uh -huh. look at it that way. I definitely do that with my clients. You know, I've, I've, a lot of clients have had 
what we would consider trauma from a psychological perspective or long, you know, like, um, the adverse childhood experience study, you know, like on that study, I think I'm mm-hmm. like at 10 is the max and it's not, it's some tough stuff. I think I experienced eight or nine of those 10. So I haven't, you know, I don't even look at the smaller stuff. I see it a little bit, at, but with my clients I do, because I recognize that there's instances in all of our life where we were completely disconnected from safety and that trauma looks very different from us. But I also have this belief that there are different levels of trauma. Not like just like if you go into a hospital, like do you need a level one trauma center or do you need, you know, like if we fall off a bike versus we fall off a car, the healing process looks a little bit different. Right. And, or, you know, if we get hit by a car, we fall off a bike, like that's a very different healing process. And so I just always make that mindful with people that, you know, if they had that disconnection from safety, they can heal it. But if it was a bigger one and a longer, a bigger hit, it, the healing journey just might look different and it might be longer. So don't have that expectation that it's, you know, people will be like, oh, I want to heal my trauma. Like, let's do it. <laughs> it's like, well, well, it took me, you know, I'm probably going to heal trauma for the rest of my life. Yeah. Even and though I have. A lot of this is lifelong process. It is. And I'm, I'm happy and I'm healthy and I have a, you know, a 15 year marriage and I've done so much work, but I know I have so much further to go and that's okay. That's we're all works in progress and we're all getting better as long as we consciously want to work on it. Well, and I love having that value of lifelong learning. I think it's critical, um, for resolution and happiness. It is, you know, Tony Robbins likes to say, if you're not growing, you're dying. I don't know if that's a little bit on the harsher side, but I definitely feel like taking that time to look at ourselves and and think about what could be better, what could make me happier, what, how could I develop myself is such a powerful thing, not only for you, but for everyone around you. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about how to go from negative five to zero, let's shift it to how we go from zero to plus five. So the positive psychology piece, you know, how Mm -hmm. do we go from just surviving to thriving? So tell me a little bit about how you incorporate positive psychology into your work. Yeah. What I love about positive psychology was, you know, as a young psych student, I felt like in clinical psych, all I did was learn what was wrong with people. (laughs) And so all of a sudden in about 2000, we have this whole practice of, what can we do right? And what, you know, that science is a, there's a science of happiness and that every day we can do these things. So I really like to explain to people that it's not just positive thinking that Mm -hmm. you're going to have those negative thoughts, but by doing the, like what we call applied positive psychology, right? By doing these practices, you can increase your happiness. So I try to integrate that. And like you were talking about, make it very personalized for all my clients and make sure that I'm taking them to their next level, but everything from looking at who your highest self is, looking at your strengths, what you bring to the table, making a different meaning from your past. You know, we talked a lot about gratitude as that foundational thing, mindfulness and being present in each moment. Like there's probably 20 different applicable things to do, but I, I have the same thing as you It's like, choose a few, Mm -hmm. get them going choose what resonates with you, what works for you. Another one I love is like it's setting intentions for who you want to be before you walk into the room or the meeting or, you know, thinking about how do I want to present myself and taking that time to really sit into that. Like, you know, who do I need to show up as a father today? Who do I need to show up in this meeting? And think about your strengths and also resolving, you know, that helps us resolve the past stories that we tell us ourselves about who we are. I see that with so many brilliant guys that, you know, don't speak up or they don't tell their, their ideas or they don't go for the promotion because their self-talk isn't very helpful. Well, yeah, one of the things I'll do and I'll have my clients do is I'll set alarms on my phone. So I'll put an alarm in the, in the morning when I wake up that'll show up as it's a silent alarm, but a a dialogue box pops up and with three values that I want to exhibit for this week. Mm. And then later in the day, it'll be, okay, here's three words that I want to use to describe myself as the ideal father, or here's three words that I want to be today at work. Yes. And then you have that powerful reflection at the end of the day is like, how could I've done that better? Mm -hmm. Like what, what could I do to take myself one step closer to those words? Yeah. I, I live by like, I have five life values that I live by and I try to make all choices by them. And that has led me in and out of a lot of things. Like I was teaching at university I decided that that didn't really align with my freedom value. <laughs> like, 
because yeah. I had to be, I had to be in a classroom and, you know, making lesson plans and all those types of things. So the, the having those values of making our moment by moment, day by day choices can really guide us towards what will ultimately make us happy when we're at willing to a admit it and b we actually take action on it because that's mm-hmm. the hard part so what are your top five values oh gosh uh freedom mm-hmm. and purpose so living a life of purpose and meaning love health and whatever makes me happy nice <laughs> um, so one more question Sure. What's, what's one of the, what's your best tool that you could offer to help men evolve to their best selves? Yeah, I thought about a lot about this and I was like, I wish I had one like silver bullet. <laughs> I know there's not just one, but I know. feel free to I throw really, two or three out. I know I did. I, you know, I think it starts with finding our beliefs and attitudes about life. So doing that gratitude work looking at our established mindsets and our attitudes because life isn't happening to us. It's happening from us. Mm -hmm. And so if we start with that mindset of, I have choices about how I live my life and I can take new actions, any three are going to help. So for me, if I would start from zero, I would definitely start with the gratitude piece, self-affirmation, like what, how, how am I talking to myself and what are, what are three things that I could say more positive about myself Mm -hmm. to myself to help deal with that inner critic that we all have. And then third, it would be getting into the body and moving the body every day. Like the more stagnant we are physically, the more stagnant we are energetically and yoga. We look at the more inflexible the body is, the more inflexible the mind is like they are connected. Like you said, the vagus nerve Mm -hmm. is huge and it runs from top to bottom. And the way we feel in our body can affect our mind. And we know that by, you know, when we're feeling sick, we're not performing great at work. When we're feeling, when we have back pain, we're not, we're not performing well. So getting that in order for ourselves, what can you do for yourself every day, mind and body? Think about that. Even if it's just two small things, maybe it's taking a walk with your partner. If you're not a big exerciser. Yeah. And I think one of the things that you kind of alluded to is the idea of core beliefs that I see hamstring a lot of my clients where, you know, I see CEOs that believe at some level that people can't be trusted. Oh, yeah. That translates to, I can't trust my VPs or senior VPs. And so they're micromanaging. And so the VPs are getting resentful and then they're throwing up roadblocks. And, and so I think, you know, examining those core beliefs is a big part of it as well. And, you know, like one of the ones that I've seen every intelligent person that I've talked to in the past believe is stupid people are annoying. Mm. And, and I think that that's, and, and so it leads to this kind of constant or frequent irritability or annoyance that just adds to your overall level of anger and people are less willing or likely to be around you. Yeah. And it's hard to see them because I always, I always say your beliefs are kind of like a fish in water. He doesn't know he's in it until you pull him out. So you're so entrenched in it that it's hard to see them, but it's true. We have these, we have core life beliefs that, you know, life is hard, that, you know, no pain, no gain. We have to work really hard in order to be successful that we can, I see a lot of sacrifice in men too. I can have this or that, like I can either have a great marriage or be really successful, but I don't know how to do both. Like, you know, I kind of, you know, just to, I guess adult language is okay, but I always see in my my guys, I say it's balls to the wall or nothing at all. And and that's another core belief, right? Is like, I've got to be on all the time. I've got to be in control. I've got to do it right or don't do it at all. Like these are all core beliefs that kind of keep us stuck. In women, we call it perfectionism. In men, you know, it's a little bit different. Yeah, one of the ones that I've seen is, you know, I'm, I'm often trying to get male clients to be more emotive or use more emotional language or more sympathetic or more empathetic in their relationships with their wife. And then they have this core belief that if I start to let out my emotions at home, I'm afraid I won't be able to contain them at work and it's going to adversely impact my work life. Yeah. I actually resonate with that as well in a lot of ways. Like, and I've seen that a lot of men, I felt like if I started to go through my past and really feel all those feelings that it was going to be like Pandora's box and I was going to fall to the ground and, you know, be a mess forever. (laughs) 
<laughs> and what's fascinating is when we start to relieve that pressure or, you know, psychology, we love to use the term of unpacking the backpack. Like imagine you have a hundred pounds on your back and every time you let out an emotion, you're just making it lighter and you'll actually show up better at work. You're going to let go of control. You're going to let go of the belief that, you know, there's no good talent out there. I hear all the same things from my mm-hmm. powerful executives. <laughs> no one can do it right. I can't delegate. It'll take me too long to train them. There's no good talent left out there. I've already had four that I've tried to train. You know, it, it's like we create these stories and our experiences become our beliefs that we then start making these minor choices, thoughts, actions that help create, you know, and we do have this like bias too. you know, we look for what we think is true. Right. So look around sometimes in your life and say, well, what could prove me wrong? What's who's one person I work with who is the opposite, who's delegating, who is showing up emotionally at home and vulnerability is the strongest person in the room who can show that. And we're, we're seeing more and more in leadership that there has to be some vulnerability and connection, especially with this next generation. Right. You know, the millennials are not cool with the stone cold type X boss. Right. They're not, they're not going to respond. Yeah. And and I talked to a lot of my C-level execs about kind of titrating your management style or leadership style to fit the person that you're talking to. So if someone's really sensitive, you don't want to be coming at them really hard and abruptly. You need to be more, more sensitive, more aware, more emotionally communicative, kind and gentle. You've got to adjust your style to fit the person that you're communicating with. So just think of you know, being able to shift gears in your car. You want to be able to shift gears in terms of your communication style, your emotional style, your relational style. And that's powerful for so many reasons. You know, I did HR for a decade. I actually led human resource human resources for a 5,000 person company. And I had 438 managers that I was responsible for. And I cannot tell you how many cases came through my door because of exactly that, Mm -hmm. you know, not being able, not being able to communicate, not being able to connect, not being able to just show some compassion, even though you fix the problem there, it, it starts the door of opening compassion to that person to even allow them to help like fix it. Yeah, to allow for the fact that they're human. Absolutely. And we've got, you know, I used to joke that I was trying to bring the human back into human resources Mm -hmm. because I think it's gone. You know, we're terrified, especially here in the state of California, we're terrified of being sued. We're terrified of saying the wrong thing. So we don't say anything at all. We ignore the problem. We don't make people take accountability in our lives or, you know, like all these things is where that vulnerability of just showing up and practicing what you're going to say before you even get in that room. You know, I used to tell my managers, be ready if this girl, if this woman that you're going to speak with is going to cry. Mm-hmm. Like, it's okay. Let her have her emotions. You don't need to fix it. Like, that's the biggest thing men have to work, learn. <laughs> they don't yeah. need- that's a hard one. <laughs> it's Part a hard one. one. I think it makes us really uncomfortable. And so the dis- we want to eliminate our own discomfort. And so to do that, we, we start to try and fix the problem. It is. And it's so, it's so powerful in our relationships too. Like that was the first thing I had to teach my husband was sometimes I just need you to listen. I don't need you to fix it. And I think it is just a cardinal way that met, you know, the male versus female brain is a little bit different and Mm -hmm. depending on your your identity, even, you know, I feel like in some ways I can be more masculine than feminine, but yeah, not trying to fix it and recognizing that they, they can handle it handing them those tissues and going over your conversations before you actually get in that room. It's another powerful practice. Yeah. yeah thank you for it, that. I appreciate that. Keeping it like I have people go through um, like a little process called like CPR before they have a, a tough conversation with anyone. It's the content. So what is the problem or like content? So what's going on then defining the exact problem and then discussing the relationship around that problem or the problem that it's like this problem is creating a, a rift in our relationship. And even as simple as someone being late, you know, here's the content you're supposed to be here at, at 8 a.m., the problem is that you're showing up at 815 and it's affecting your relationship with me because I'm losing trust in you and your teammates can't depend on you. Yeah. I love that. Simple and effective. Yeah. This also makes me think of, there was a study that came out years ago about, they were looking at doctors who had made mistakes in surgery Mm. and they were kind of tracking the, the typical medical approach at the time. Hospitals were saying, don't admit, you know, that you made a mistake. Like, and so they would just come in and say, this is what happened. 
thank you very much, and it was very cold and clinical. So they compared that group against a group of doctors that actually came into the patient and apologized and said, you know, I'm really sorry, I made this mistake, I don't know, I left a sponge inside you after surgery. But what they found is that patients were far less likely to sue if they just got the apology. Mm -hmm. So if they just got the personal accountability and some compassion and some humanity, they were far more understanding. And, and we fear is, oh my God, like if I, if I take accountability, then they're going to sue me and then I lose. Absolutely. And I saw that all the time in leadership and it's the same exact thing. A lot of times things would not go on if the manager took accountability and said, Hey, I messed up or I, I shouldn't have spoken to, you know, I, I didn't, even if it's not in a way that's like admitting fault, you can say, you know, I didn't show up the way I wanted to show up with you. Yeah. And that's a really powerful thing just to hear that I'm working on being better and, or I was upset acknowledging that, you know, I was upset at that situation. I didn't handle it the way I'd like to have handled it. That's not admitting fault. It's, it's admitting that you're human too, mm -hmm. and that you get to make mistakes and that you still actually care about your employee. Cause that's all they really want. Yeah. I screwed up. I'm sorry. I hurt you and I'll work to make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. It will avoid so many problems on so many levels. <laughs> hey, well, Tori, we got to wrap up. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's been immensely useful. Um, tell us where we can find you, your website, your Facebook, your Instagram. How do people contact you if they want to work? Yeah. So my website is just toryhealth.com. So T-O-R-I-H-E-L-F as in frank.com. And then you can find me on Facebook or Instagram. I'm at the transformation babe because I help people transform their life. <laughs> okay. And those are both Facebook and Instagram. Yes. Same handle, Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Correct. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tori. I really appreciate it. I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 